Are you doing math for whatever reason? Might be your day job, might be your student role, maybe you're just trying to divert yourself because Lord knows we could all use a little diversion these days. Okay. If you're doing math, are you finding that you're making more bloopers than usual? If so, hey, I'm with you. Blooperville, really, we're all doing it. And it's a, it's a function of stress. And it's a function of some other things. So welcome in. I'm Dr. Aliana J. Moren, otherwise known as Dr. AJ. And you are coming to the first of what, what will probably be several Dr. AJ's blooper reels, because I make bloopers all the time. Now, in this blooper reel, <laughs> we're going to discuss three that are, are useful in terms of being teaching. Uh, because I make bloopers of the basic sort, you know, routinely, and maybe you do too, but I, I know that I lose track of my plus minus signs all the time. I divide by two instead of multiplying by two or vice versa. That kind of thing. And what I wind up doing, <laughs> what I wind up doing, really, is when I'm doing this long, complex t derivation and the results differ, it's like best two out of three, or, you know, or the best Supreme Court type of decision, best five out of nine. Um, sometimes it comes down to that. Sometimes it's like checking them again and again and taking the one that we think is best and referencing the others against it. And sometimes bloopers creep through. So I'm going to show you a few today. But at the end, because this is more than just amusement, and it's more than just what the Germans had this wonderful word for it called schadenfreude, meaning taking pleasure in somebody else's pain or misfortune. I mean, we can go there today, definitely. That's an option. But there's some little learning moments at the end. I'm going to give you two or three little tips that if you string them together and incorporate them, particularly if you're going through, as we all are at this moment, kind of a, you know, it's it's a tension wrought time, which really influences our ability to focus the way we'd like. So they may help smooth things over and save you not just a little embarrassment. We can usually catch things before they hit that level. I mean, not always, but usually. But it might save you time and aggravation and fuss. So let's dive on in. We're going to cut to the slide deck, okay? Of the three big bloopers that we're looking at today, the first one is just a function of ditziness, and I will, I will just own that. I was ditzy, I was spacey, but the lesson that we can learn and that we'll recap at the end of this is, is when we have two mental processes going at the same time, that introduces more opportunities for error. And in that case, I was trying to do my mathematics and format a PowerPoint slide at the same time or oh, that typically you know it, it can it can work but it's an er it's a great opportunity for errors to creep in because we've got two thought processes blooper number one started back in video number 3b that was the chain rule as part of the back propagation series and this is the equation that that has been governing that entire series it's the derivative of the sum squared error with respect to the connection weight going from hidden node H to output node K. The blooper occurred when I started to talk about the chain rule and the steps that we would need to take as we got the derivative of the transfer function. So I broke the transfer function down into a composition of three functions, and this is where the blooper starts. The, if you'll take a look at part one there, overall, we're supposed to be looking at composition that reads f of g of h of x. That's the structural organization of this function. And instead of writing a definition for f of g, I wrote 1 over f of g. Now, this is the blooper. It's an equation 1 there. And it's not that it's wrong to say that 1 over f of g is that f of g to the minus 1 power, where the minus 1 refers to the whole function. That in itself is correct, but I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to define f of g in terms of g, then g of h in terms of h, h of x in terms of x, and I blew that sequence. So it was just being ditzy. That's all we can say. So I goofed, 
And of course, I was able to recover that. I found my own blooper a day or so later, deleted the whole YouTube vid that had the slide, redid the set of slides, redid that particular slide, redid the YouTube, rehosted it. It was mostly a matter of time loss and aggravation. So lesson number one, be really, really careful when you're running two thought processes at the same time. Sometimes you might just want to separate the thought processes and write down your equations first and then format them, whether you're using uh, LaTeX or you're trying to format them into a PowerPoint slide. However you're doing it, separate the thoughts. Okay, next up, it's a notation change. I'll show you what I mean. It was when I was dealing with just very, very basic notation for a simple multilayer perceptron. And the goal here was to refine the notation that I was using for the nodes in the output layer. This next blooper is a little bit more deliberate, if you would. I wound up changing my notation in referencing the output nodes. And that makes sense because I was running my index from 1 up through O, O because we have an output node, and it just there was just too much possibility for error when somebody was writing out the equation because it could be so easily construed as that O being a uh, zero. So I changed it. But what I, what I introduced was the potential for error across different videos, different places where I'd use the old notation versus the new. And I tried to catch that and I didn't get it all. And so what this what this potentially does is introduce confusion into somebody who's reading and really trying to pay attention to the work. And at first they're seeing in some older vids the index running from 1 up through O and then later 1 up through K. So a tiny, tiny, tiny little change percolates throughout the entire system. You folks doing software and revision updates know how frustrating this can be. So the lesson learned here is to try to think through your notation very carefully the first time through so you don't have to make these system-wide multiple types of publications or, um, or information source presentations changes throughout. Let's go on to the next one because this is this is actually the most interesting and the most, in, a, in an oddball sort of way, um, scary of all the bloopers that I've made. This is from one of the very first YouTubes that I made. In it, I realized that I had made a significant notational error a couple of months after I'd published it. it. It really took me a while to figure out, ooh, that's a big one. But I was too busy to go back and change the vid, and I didn't want to delete the vid. I gave my students in the AI and deep learning class that I'm teaching at Northwestern University's Master of Science and Data Science program, I gave them the challenge of finding my error. Nobody found it. Gave the challenge to the students in the next quarter and the next. And I think in this quarter, nobody has found that error. It is subtle. And subtle errors, the kinds that aren't like, you know, splash in your face like that first blooper that I showed you. Um, Subtle errors are the most dangerous. So here's what it is. Look at the index. Indices, by the way, are a great source of confusion. We'll talk about that some other day, but notice that the index is running from zero up to a number. What happens is that I'm trying to think Python style and mathematically at the same time. In Python, we do our counting from 0 up through whatever the total number of nodes is, minus 1. In math, we start from 1 and go up to whatever the total number of nodes is. But I conflated the two. I got them jammed together and, few and confused. And so we wound up with having the index running from 0 up through not the number minus 1, but the number. And you'd have to actually sit down and start to write code based on this before the, the program would begin to blow up and you'd realize, ooh, you know, mistake here, mistake, and then have to trace it all the way back. It'd be enormously confusing. So, of course, I'm going to change now the slide and I've got to change the whole video. 
So it's going to disappear within a reasonable amount of time and there will be a new notation vid in its place. So let's take a deep breath on this and reflect and figure out how this impacts each of us individually. Because it's one thing to have a nice chuckle at somebody else's expense. I mean, it's a tension reliever. It's a stress buster. It's worth it, okay? But what if you're the one that's in danger of making a similar blooper? Okay, there's three things that we're going to look at. Three things that will help us to, I can't say be blooper free because to error is human, <laughs> but blooper minimized, okay? Number one, it helps if we're doing something mathematical to not do it on the fly as we're formatting. Maybe just writing it down ahead of time, looking at that and saying, okay, yeah, that's right, and then format that. Separate the processes. Number two, think through our notation at the very beginning of a process. And maybe just pause and walk away for a little bit and then come back to it and say, what could go wrong? Where are there potential, you know, rooms for confusion or doubt or error? And how can I minimize those by changing my notation just a little tiny bit? That would save you aggravation in having to go back and rectify things or handle a cross-correlation problem. Third, it's that subtle little tiny stuff that creeps in and is so really hard to detect that comes about when we conflate two thought processes and try to merge them into the same work without, without giving separate attention to each of them. That's why I wound up merging Python style counting with typical mathematical style counting and getting the total number of indices wrong. So the thing to do is to try, in, insofar as possible, to separate modes and then cross compare and then fuse. Now, I've got a couple of examples to show on this that are not my own work necessarily, but those of others where I've been studying and and teaching myself, you know, as we all are these days, teaching myself from papers. And if you're at the graduate level and beyond, the way that we learn is not so much through books where everybody's um, got access to something that another person has basically pre-digested and put into a nice neat form and made notationally consistent. And so it's relatively speaking smooth going. But if you are teaching yourself something from original source material and you're doing that contrast and compare and correlation across multiple sources, which is frankly it's how most of us have to learn, that can be extremely frustrating and often the, the root cause of frustration is just the notation. So I'm going to give some examples about, of that kind of thing in a vid down the road. Share some horror stories, okay? And maybe just encourage you to take heart because you're not alone. It's not a kind of thing where you can beat yourself up and say, oh, I'm, I'm just being a goofus myself. I'm not getting it. This is so hard. Why am I struggling? Oh, no. Working across notation, across different papers on the same thing, especially if they are really describing the same thing and have different notation, can be the most mind-boggling, frustrating, tear-your-hair-out thing in the world. Quick summary, and I'll, I'll close. Uh, last year I published, and it was to archive, it's not a journal, but I published a derivation of variational bays because I was reading Carl Friston's work and trying to, um, to get the, the source material for the equations which he presented in brief summary form and I was looking for the, the rationale behind them. So I was working with two different sources. So a total of three different sources, Friston's and then two others. I'll go into detail in, in another vid. And there were, there were differences in the notation that were different enough to be absolutely maddening. I wound up, after I'd translated them and cross-compared and cross-hatched everything, calling my paper a Rosetta Stone because it was a translation effort more than it was a derivation effort. So you're not alone. This stuff, it is frustrating. It is confusing. We do make bloopers, but here's to your catching them early and maybe getting a little bit of rest and fixing those bloopers and having a better day. Thank you for joining me. Till soon.